Should I introduce myself or everybody knows? My name is Andy Maschietti. I'm the director of The Flash. Do you want me to do that? <laughs> that was terrible. I'm gonna say that again. I'm, I suck at this. Wait, hold on. I hope you guys can edit this. Okay. Hello, my name is Andy Muschietti. I'm uh, the director of The Flash. Um, and I'm gonna take you through the story, the movie, and some of my ideas of this uh, incredible cinematic adventure. I mean, making a movie is such a big process. As a filmmaker, you're constantly finding things in a script or in a story, not only to make a great film experience for the audience, but to keep yourself excited about it, which is an essential part of the creative process. Miraculously, we've managed to pre-produce this film through a full year of pandemic. There is no compromise, it's the opposite. You, you want things like you've never wanted them before and you fight for them. And I've exhausted a lot of people, let me tell you, in this process. Pre-production is hard because you have to cope with a lot of technical stuff that is necessary because you're working with a crew, you need to communicate with the crew, so you need to express a lot of ideas that are not fully cooked sometimes. But the crew knows this, they just want you to at least show them a blueprint of what you're thinking to start working on it. Then later, all that work will converge and some things will fall apart, some things will stick. So at the beginning, you're starting with a lot of ideas in the air and as you get closer to the shoot, everything crystallizes one way or the other. We are seeing the light. We start shooting in five weeks. We're gonna do this. <laughs> It was very exciting because it was day one. Of course, you have to climb the Everest. It's, it's the first day is like, you can't even like start to imagine what that will be. The first day on set uh, was electric. After having prepped for a year and two months because of the pandemic slowing everything down, we were so ready. So our first Pre-shoot day. Pre-shoot is testing the camera and the lights, but we generally use it to shoot something real. And we shot with Jeremy Irons as Alfred on a green screen that it's supposed to be the Batcave. When you're shooting, it's very good to have people who, uh, who amuse you, who you interest you. I have high hopes for Andy. I liked him a lot. And I think if you like your director, that's a huge help. He's a consummate professional and great company. Brilliant. Cut. Okay. It doesn't feel like day one, but it is day one. Oh, yeah, it's true. It's day one. <laughs> You really can't wrap your head around a project this big. I think one of our biggest achievements was being able to keep our key figures, like the amazing Paul Osterberry, who's our production designer, Henry Bram, our DP, and Alex Byrne, costume designer. You know, all, all these people that are really key to having the movie we have now and that we wouldn't have had had we lost them during a global pandemic. That was the trickiest part, I think, to, to be able to keep everybody together. Hello, and welcome to Flash Stunt Training. Lucky for me on this one, because I knew Ezra and I had a relationship with him, it was really easy with Ezra. He knows that we do a lot of treadmill running for the character. So he knew that he had to keep his cardio fitness up. Um, there's a certain symmetry that we wanted to keep with him. We didn't want him to be too broad in the shoulders. We didn't want him to have too thick a waist. He had to look lean. Let's do it by stage. And then Pete will give you a nod to take it up. Cue it, so just look at Ezra, see that he's in the zone before you cue it to okay. go up. OK, cool. Are you videoing this, Andy? Because I was going to say, video how quick his legs go in this. We're currently driving through the back lanes of sunny Hertfordshire on our way to a top secret location. We are going to pick up the 1989 Batmobile. Now, I've seen it a couple of times, but every time you see it, you can't help but stand back and just be like, wow, it's just such an impressive bit of kit. 
started on the button, first time. A little bit smoky, but it was all right. Now we head back to the studios. Wait, yeah, I get hit by lightning? No, 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 no. relax, you don't, you don't get hit. I signed up for this job to be Ezra Miller's acting double. Like, that was quite fulfilling for me as an actor as well, because I was handed an entirely new task. Like, this job has not been done before by another actor. This new volume capture technology is completely new. It was crazy sort of seeing how this whole thing fitted together with this movie. I am not getting hit by lightning! I mean, like, 75% of this film, it's unreal. Like, it's crazy. Poncho section. We did a scene in the crime lab where we were soaking wet and doing all these crazy stunts and in a, in a witness harness, this, this incredibly designed piece of kit that is really rigid to act with and very restrictive as an actor, as, as my job has to be so physical. But I didn't think for one second that this was an impossible task. For the overall experience, totally worth it. <laughs> You must have tracked my boss signal. When I wake up and I'm at the table and I get up, that was my first day on the job, officially. It was my emaciated look, which was so much fun. And it's also the day that, for me, felt like was the most raw and honest for her. They gave me a more aggressive boy. You can remember these other guys that saved you. They could be the Russian. And action. Who are you? It was all very new to me, right? It's my first time being in a movie. It was my first time seeing how everybody functioned and the whole crew. And I'm always gonna remember that day. I remember Andy being like, beautiful work, Sashingi. Love it, love it. Andy's accent is iconic. Watch that. Welcome to the back you. Finally, like. finally, no. semi done. No. Or in the words of, uh, of Ridley Scott, I, I it's a good start. <laughs> yeah. We had about 15 weeks of build, two weeks of dressing and actually this is the last day of that two weeks of dressing and pre-lighting. The inspirations for me are the two most iconic bat, bat caves which are the Tim Burton one which is Michael Keaton and uh, also blended certain things from the Christopher Nolan bat cave. For me the design of this cave has to kind of straddle the two. The bat cave was incredible. It was the largest bat cave ever built. When you walked in it was so immersive. It's really it's based on, on the Tim Burton movie original designs but with a different scale, uh, probably what the bat cave should be, which is a huge cave with bats. Do you want it bigger? Yeah. <laughs> I think this is one of the few times, it may be the only time that a complete cave has been built, which is quite an honor in itself. Is this like the cave? biggest bat cave constructed? I would say, For yeah. sure. It has to be, right? hundred yeah. percent. It has to be, yeah. A hundred percent. It's a little bit bigger than the Nolan one. Construction built this amazing bat cave with a rostrum that the Batmobile had to sit on. And one of the problems with that was it was built without thinking about how the Batmobile could probably be put on it. You might recognise this as being the sort of truck that they use at airports. That can go about 20 foot in the air. Plan is the Batmobile goes in there on a big ramp, strap it down, get it all secure. We raise it up with the crew in there, get it into the stage, and then slowly, very slowly, we'll drive the Batmobile out of here whilst being about 20 foot in the air onto the stage, onto the rostrum, into position. She's on. She's on, she's up. We can just leave her here for a few weeks and then we can worry about getting it back down again. But for now, this is where she lives. In the beginning of our day, we're back up on the computer platform, doing dialogue. We'll still have our crane down here below to do any wine shots. But then eventually, the Batwing descends. We have a couple shots that we'll be shooting that day. Our two berries actually come down from the computer platform and end up over a little bit behind where Andy is right now, I think, and watch that Batwing come down. When I first saw the Batcave, I knew immediately that no one had ever seen anything like that before and that Paul Osterberry had built the best Bat cave in history, bar none. I mean, I'm sorry if this offends anyone, but it's true. Next best thing. <laughs> you write a, a script that is based on a legend like Michael Keaton's Batman, and you're gambling a lot <laughs> because he may say no. 
but he loved it and he said yes and he's been an amazing partner and we can't wait to shoot with him being able to bring him back into a story as batman is just is thrilling the first time Michael Keaton came to see the Batcave, he was so shocked that he actually filmed it to send to Tim Burton. Keaton asked me to take pictures because he really wanted to preserve that moment for his grandchildren. Of course, I took my own phone and started taking selfies with him, <laughs> which he was totally okay with. That was very special. It's the power of an actor. He's got the black makeup under the mask. He suited up. The first time I saw him on the set as Batman, my jaw dropped. And I'm like, holy f it's Batman. One of my favorite moments was the big Michael Keaton moment. And it was the moment he said, I'm Batman. It was amazing. There's that this world. Oh my God, I mean, just to be there for that was iconic. We had a very small window in which that thing had to work and a lot of factors that could have screwed up the scene. But when the time came and he showed up in his suit, I was very focused on making the scene work. So I'm sorry if I wasn't that excited about it. I was excited, by the way. <laughs> I would wear it every single day if it were. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Captain. Hello, Doctor. The exciting things about this project is designing a new flash suit. Don't get me wrong, I love the Justice League suit. I just thought that we needed a change, given that five years have gone by and he's befriended Bruce Wayne. Bruce would provide him with a suit that has a better technology. Oh yeah, that feels better. It was very challenging to execute because in my mind, this was made of different layers. This is a suit that is more organic, it's more flexible, and uh, it incorporates also this electricity conductors that light up when, when he's running or when he's getting ready to run. So it's a suit made of lights. It's a suit made of circuits, but there's like a satin feel. The flash costume itself was our biggest challenge. The suit itself is supposed to harness the energy that's created when the flash is running at the incredible speeds that he runs at. And it's supposed to be able to it, trap that energy in and recycle it and use it again. But also it has to have a, an exterior that is impervious to the frictions and the things that he encounters as he's running at these incredible speeds. So this is the interior cowl, it'll be uh, powdered red. Uh, this is the exterior cowl, which will be done in the clear um, urethane. This will go over the top of this to give it that cool translucent look. It takes a team of, of 20 people in, in the schedule sense at least two weeks to make to make each suit. With the general wear and tear and the usage of the suit, we've had to be constantly making them anyway, so we haven't stopped the process of making them. So we've been making flash suits on and off for, uh, for over 12 months from the beginning of the process to the end. I'm very happy with the result. All that sheen and satin and the lights and the layers. I'm, I'm super proud of it. It's sad and it's happy and it's sad. But it's the last day in the back view. There's a face on the road. That's such a depressing photo. How did I feel when they tore down the bat cave? Just as I couldn't believe that we had built that, I could not believe that we were actively destroying that gem because I would have left it there living forever to be visited and appreciated. No, no, it's great, it's, it's monumental. You want me to do something different? Just one tiny thing, tiny yeah. thing, one tiny thing. <laughs> Just to try. Give me the options so I can help. Andy Muschietti gives himself a role every single time. He plays a hot dog eater outside of the courthouse. <laughs> this was amazing. What the napkin did was monumental. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a picture wrap on Andy Muschietti. 
Andy had said to me, dude, we need to get you in this movie. Because I've done almost as many days of filming as Ezra's been doing. And they found this role for me as the reporter. Uh, Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen, can you tell us a bit more about what happened, please? Everyone came up to me like, it was so great to finally see your face on camera. It just meant like the world to actually have, you know, a part in this movie. You made it in the movie. <laughs> okay, we're getting close. I'm gonna stay airborne and take out their sky power. A lot of the way the flash evolved was that it was shot in a very freestyle way. And it's about the relationship of the camera to the actors. We're interested in the intimacy of the relationship between these characters. So that means putting the camera very close and connected to the performances. And not just close and connected, but actually emotionally and intuitively connected insert the audience as almost as part of the performance. Everybody's work is woven together without discussing it because you're all tuned into each other. And therefore, that's where the intimacy comes from. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a lot of crews. Mike Disco, who's one of the producers, said we need to get a cake for Keaton's last day. When the cake arrived, Mike Disco came to me and said, we can't give him the cake. And I'm like, why? He's like, because it's a monstrosity. So I saw it and I laughed so hard. I said, we absolutely have to give him this cake. Who made this? Cake. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I never met Superman, but there's there's no way he's this awesome. Talk a lot. We were on top of Batman House, and I remember Andy calling me over and being like, "Come look at this," and it was the first time that I saw myself, and I was like, "Oh my god." <laughs> We've done it, right? We created the character. Like we've we've gotten here. She's in midair. She's in the suit. She's got the hair. There was a big sense of ease, I think, for me. That was a moment that it kind of all came together for me, and I felt like I could breathe and just really trust in the work that we were doing. I got to go to the set and really see from the ground up how this thing was being put together. A great example is the Supergirl reveal, which is first wearing the costume, that amazing shot of her. And I think it's just one of those environments where you, you just feel inspired musically. I mean, that all comes from Andy and his choices. Here we go. Ready? We're in the suburbs of Central City. We're in day 64, and we should have done this in the US. That's what we thought we were gonna do, but then COVID hit. So we had to do it in the UK, where basically there's no American-looking neighborhoods. And it's been very exciting, very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we wanted for it to have a real feeling. In discussions with Andy, green was an important color for him. He wanted he wanted nature to be surrounding this house. I can't do that in the back lot because we can build all the houses you want, but we can't make those massive trees. And so Paul said, I think we should build it. And I know exactly what I want. I want a, a line of trees and I'm gonna put the houses in between the trees. And we walked into this field and there was this perfect line of oak trees. With careful planning permissions, we got to put a whole road, driveways, sidewalks, and build five houses. I'm still surprised every once in a while when I walk onto a set and they've built an entire suburban neighborhood in a field where there was nothing here but grass and trees so that we can get these six or seven shots in the front yard. So the only real thing here is the trees. Everything else we created. God, we wish we could keep it because every movie that comes into the UK is desperately trying to find a US neighborhood and they don't exist. But in order to comply with the regulations in the area, we have to take it down as soon as we're done. You went to the store this morning. I forgot the tomatoes. Andy called me and said, I would like Nora have your eyes, your look. And I said, okay, I mean, <laughs> it's been such an incredible experience. It makes me so happy. Yes, my friend. 
That was great. Say it again. Make sure you're not goodbye, else you're not living the dream. No, that's, that's not what I said. I still have to explain that, that to me. The real climax of, of the movie happens uh, in the supermarket. Challenges there were protecting the, the atmosphere to let the actors access those emotions. Make sure all of our walkies are off, please. Yeah. It was uh, probably anticlimactic scenery because it was a supermarket, but with actors like Ezra and Maribel, we can really pull a highly emotional climax. I remember shooting that scene, that moment, and Ezra was crying during a break, and Maribel was crying. They brought it, and we all cried like babies. Your mom must be grateful you came to visit her. She's very lucky to have you. What in a literal hell? Is this place? Why is it so foggy? We started looking for Wayne Manor in the very early days, pre-COVID. Andy really wanted to use elements from the first Michael Keaton film. So the first place we took Andy to was Nebworth, which he loved. He loved the history of the house, but mainly because Keaton was there. However, Andy felt the house was a bit too short. So we decided we'd use the gates, but we'd look for a different house for the main view on the rooftop of Wayne Manor. We showed him some other places, and we ended up at a house called Burley House. When Andy saw this house, he was absolutely, this is going to be his Wayne Manor. And at Burley House, we built a well on the hillside, which was the entrance to the back cave. We used many interiors, and we shot some of the exteriors there with Dominic Tui's incredible mist, the special effects world. Once we got into that house, Andy wanted to recreate some of the scenes from the first Burton movie again, which were another house called Hatfield House. It had a very specific look, at black and white patterned floor, and this was the armory room. So we actually went back to the same location they shot that. Barry, stop acting like a child, okay? Grow up. But then you had a scene where they're actually thrown down a staircase. Sadly, Burley or Hatfield, the configuration of the staircase just didn't work. So we spent about two months looking for wooden staircases. That took us to another stately home about 20 minutes from our studio, which was pretty good, uh, called Tring School of Performing Arts. And the configuration had to be a staircase coming down with a front door. And this is the joy of Andy again. He gives you a directive. He's like, I need the staircase, because he knows months before we shoot how he's going to shoot it. That patchwork of locations all work together, and that's how we sort of got to the four places. Make sure that it's all the way down. And give me a beat, a solid beat before, before he comes walking in. in. Yeah. 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 There's one particular gag that we did that I'm really happy about the way we crafted it. At this point in the film, Barry is in his Flash costume, and he's standing in front of his old childhood home that he doesn't live in anymore at night. But the flashback takes place in the day. We had to shoot young Barry running out of the house past Ezra, and Andy really wanted it to go from day to night. And we thought about it, we thought about it, and we finally said, you know what, why don't we shoot it like a play? Why don't we shoot it at night? And Henry thought about it and said, that sounds fun. I'll build a big softbox light source overhead to turn it to day for a moment, and then we'll switch it off as the kid runs out. And it'll go to night, and we'll be back to the way we've been shooting the rest of the scene all night long anyway. And that's what it is in the movie. Now, Brian and I did a few other visual effects tricks in the background, but other than that, it's just a big switch off the lights gag, and I, I think it's great. Three, two, one, action. We are in George Square in the center of Glasgow. The buildings here are a lot lower than Gotham would be, but the architecture is really interesting. It's old, heavy stone, a lot of sculpture. But it's actually nice to have real textures in the background. You know, we can only build so much, and so it's nice to have the length and breadth of scope that we get from a proper practical location. That's when my creative juices started flowing, and I really am in the location, and I'm seeing what we can do or can't do. And one of the things that we did on this was also make the city very populated. That sense of reality and real sense of traffic 
there's people running out of the way. There's innocent bystanders who potentially could get hurt. I think that really gave it the realism that this world exists. Background and action. Go. Bruce, this is a huge mess. Why aren't you here? So we're at Central City Hospital. The opening scene where Barry has to save all the people. Did I say Central City? <laughs> that. <laughs> that. Let's get the house and recover the This is Gotham, Central City. Go uh -huh. test faster, everyone. <laughs> How's it feel to be halfway? Or past halfway? Oh, past halfway. It feels good. It's like a marathon. You know? we're, we're past the wall, so now it's like, just keep going. Just keep going. It's 4.05 and the sun is about to come out. And we're desperately trying to get this stunt in. It's basically Ezra cabled up, coming towards the camera at very high speed. Nine, three, two, one, Awesome. Perfect. Do you do you alternating do leg? You gotta, no, but you gotta roll through it. You gotta go and roll through it. Dave disapproves my running technique all the time. Exhausted me with his running training. Now I'm exhausted before running. Good job, Dave. Ready! And three, two, one! Action! If we're gonna do another one, we've gotta go right now, please. Right. Eunice, what are you think, another 10, and then we'll see where we are? Okay, guys, let's take it off and roll the 10. Yeah. Three, two, one, action! You went to where no man's been before. <laughs> I love you, thank you. We're standing in front of Bocchini Pizzeria. Bocchini is my football hero. Bocchini played in Independiente, which is my, my football team uh, in Argentina during the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so here's my homage to Ricardo Enrique Bocchini. So it's our first day in the Chrono Ball sequence. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of work ahead. Um, Ezra will be very tired because there's, there's a lot of running. Well, this is where uh, we get, we're shooting most of Barry's runs. It goes to the past, and then the present, and the future, and back to the future, and back to the past. So shall we do full speed yes. from there? From things to yes. the past, I think. Ready, and Ezra, and action. Tunnel one. <laughs> And ultraviolet. Yeah, cut. Cut that. We're on a bridge. We built this tarmac, as you guys can see. And Wonder Woman comes and saves the day. Sorry, I'm late. Basically, that means that we have Ben Affleck coming back as Bruce Wayne and Batman. We have Gal Gadot. Wonder Woman, and of course, lovely Ezra. I think it's a bit of a reunion. They haven't seen each other for a while. And for us as a crew, it's great because we've been at this point shooting today for 94 days. So we're getting all like a lift and I'm f Being bad is sort of ridiculous and ultimately an exercise of ego because I The lesser of truth. Give my money. Never them. gets old. Much There's something magic when these people put on their costumes. You believe it. They look like and they seem like superheroes. Being the director of the movie, your head is very much focused on the scene, on how you're going to make it work, on what you're going to tell the actors. Ben's camera operating now. He's been here for one day. He's already camera operating. Ben blew my socks off. We met for two hours and discussed the scenes. Two hours later, he had punched up his part. My ego's too big to say thank you to anyone else. It was such a privilege to see someone that cared so much about this iconic character. It was lovely. Trying to align the schedules of Ben Affleck, Gal Gadot, 
Ezra Miller is no small feat, especially in a COVID world. It was very difficult, but we pulled it off. Oh, yes. It's always wonderful to get into the suit and to see the guys. It's great. Gal had a baby during our shooting period, so there was a lot to take into consideration, but she came for a day. That joy that you see in the character is Gal, and it's real, and it was wonderful to have her around. You know, of course, seen with, a, with some perspective, we had Batman and Wonder Woman and The Flash all together in the same shot. It's really fantastic. Hey, nice suit. Looking good, Barry. Ready? And three, two, one, action! Very, very stop! <sighs> We're about six weeks away from completion. We're now getting into the final battle and the last acts of the bigger set pieces. Paul and I very much co-editors on the film. Paul was on set in London uh, with main unit to uh, support Andy in the immediacy of uh, cutting the video tap split. And then Paul's edits would come back to me in Los Angeles and I'd further refine the assessment of all takes and best moments. On set, I don't have necessarily the time to kind of go through everything as I would in a cutting room. It's almost to a degree like a proof of concept, like what we're doing now is going to work. You just surrender this time. Ezra did a, a tremendous job in really articulating the differences between three distinctly different characters that to my eye were performed by three different cast members and staying true to what he and Andy had derived. I am the Flash. And I can save everyone. Nobody dies. This is the opening, part of the opening scene of the movie in which the hospital collapses, basically. The first 20 minutes of any film is really important. And if you can, for me, make it a physical side, I think people tune in to it much more. The hospital, the room is real. It's quite a large room and we've made it tilt to um, 20 degrees in probably just over a second. That's been great to get physical with those elements. And I think it's gonna be a fun sequence. Ready and action. Both Zod and Feora had to look like they did exactly 10 years ago. You know, Michael has this giant scar and he has a little glued on goatee. So Michael came back, hadn't seen him in 10 years, walks into the marquee and goes, I know you. Well, I was so excited when I walked in and saw Victoria it just really put me at ease, you know, to see an old familiar face. You are the one, Kara zor -El. He was a great sport, and he morphed back into exactly Zod as he was before. Terraforming has begun. This world must die so that ours may live again. And he's just wonderfully visual, such a, a wonderful artist, very easy to work for, but very precise, you know. We did a lot of takes, which I like. I like somebody who doesn't just settle for whatever comes out the first go around, who's really looking for something specific. So, how are you feeling heading into last week? I'm doing very good. I'm very tired, exhausted, but very happy with the movie so far, all the things that we as a group achieved. About the work itself, uh, I'm probably not going to miss it because I had enough. 120 plus days is, uh, is enough for a production. This is the, the longest production I've ever been in. You know, a project like this that is so, so long. If you don't have a group that, that acts like a family, it's, it's very hard to keep going. Uh, and I think I'm going to miss them very much. You really make your family and, and the crew, you know, you're away from your real family, you're away from the place you live in. Although I work with my brother, which is great, uh, there's a lot of people that become really close to you and I'll miss them. And hopefully I'll see them in the next round, whenever that next round is. For now, it's a, it's a goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a picture wrap on Ezra Miller. Oh! That's not true <laughs> at all. I have uh, 
so many more shots to do. But what <laughs> it is, is it's a picture wrap on us. Um, the greatest crew ever. I really think probably of all time. Just a couple of words. I'm not very good at speeches, but thank you for getting this far. I know it was very difficult and very long, too. So I want to thank you for all the hard work and the effort. And I promise you I'll do my best to make all that work count. I think it's going to be a great movie if I don't <laughs> up in the, in the edit. I love you all and thank you so much. And I hope I, I see you guys again on the next movie. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It was amazing. I couldn't possibly have a, a better crew and cast. I can't complain. I mean, I, I, I complain because it was so long and, and it took me three years to make this movie, but you know how it is. It's always better when, when there's good vibes and there's a real connection between every member of the crew and the cast. It wasn't artificial or unnatural. It just happened and I couldn't be luckier. <laughs> you know what this is? A piece of a chair. Baby shower. <laughs>